Dr. Secha? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Can you hear we me? We can see you clearly, so please uh, uh, start your procedure and in introduce the, your patient and uh, your team. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ravi Sacha from the University of North Carolina. We're at Asan Medical Center, and I'm here with Dr. Park, and uh, he will be introducing the, the patient today. Yes, okay. I will introduce our patient. Uh, 70, uh, 57 year old male patient, this patient, uh, was admitted for treatment of clot cation in the left leg. The peripheral angiography showed total occlusion of left superficial femoral artery. Uh, the ABI was uh, one, uh, 0 0.63 on left side. He is a current smoker and had a history of coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. He had already received stent implantation at his right superficial femoral artery three months ago. Okay, and then uh, as you see, the, uh, this patient has left uh, superficial femoral artery for total occlusion. So we have uh, the 57 year old patient with a totally occluded left SFA. Uh, there is a nub that's visible, but only when we went to steep LAO about 45 degrees. Before that, we could not see the nub. And we've taken a couple more pictures. The total occlusion with reconstitution in the adductor canal via collaterals from the profunda. And below that, his popliteal artery is unremarkable, and he has three vessel runoff. He has a claudication as a presenting symptom, no critical limb ischemia. And uh, so we are here to help him feel better. And I wanted to ask the, the panel uh, how uh, you think we should proceed. Any thoughts uh, for the audience? Um, any comments? Yes, we have a distinguished panel. I haven't introduced anybody, but go ahead and uh, list, look forward to some statements from the panel, what they would do, and introduce yourself. What do you think, Dr. Garcia? Thanks, Rick. Um, Rajiv, uh, I was just wondering, is, is this gentleman, he's got a very very dominant profunda, it's very uh, well collateralized downstream. Is he, you know, failed an exercise program before moving forward with the uh, with this intervention, because I think that the the stump is so short that you will be affecting the uh, or potentially affecting the profunda at some point. Fair enough. That's a great question. Uh, my exposure to this patient is just today. I understand he's a current smoker, a diabetic, a hypertensive, all the typical risk factors, and he still continues to smoke. Uh, I don't know what his um, previous exposure to a full-fledged exercise program has been. Uh, Dr. Park, any? Uh, thing you can add in terms of how much he's been uh, exposed to a full-fledged exercise program given the, uh, the size of the profunda. He may improve just with uh, conservative management. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, your point is well taken, though, and that is that uh, these total SFA occlusions have a high risk of restenosis regardless of what you do these days. And if he uh, benefits from uh, smoking cessation, management of risk factors, and exercise program, that may be good enough for him. And uh, I'm not sure if that's been done for this particular patient, but I agree should be done for uh, all these patients before proceeding. Dr. Sacha, you cannot see the classification of the SFA. So did you done by other imaging modality, CT or uh, Doppler? at the entire SFA? You know, I think all we have, uh, as far as the information I've uh, been exposed to, is an ABI and an angiogram. I don't believe there's a CTA. Uh, if there is, I haven't seen it. Uh, but just from oh, there we are. the mm. images. Oh, there we go. We do, we do have it. All right. Um, OK. So uh, it uh, does not look like there's too much calcification, at least by uh, the CTA on both sides. He's undergone revascularization of the right already. Uh, but by CTA, as I'm looking at right now, and by angio as well, there does not appear to be significant calcification. Of course, it can be underestimated by uh, angio. A CTA is usually pretty good at it, and I don't see any significant calcification. Any um, thoughts from the panel? I know many Japanese guys that uh, try to intraluminal angioplasty like the, this kind of long CTO. So how about the 
uh, uh, opinion of the Dr. Yokoi or Dr. Uh, Ida? We are, we are becoming more conservative uh, these kind of religion. used to do a cross the wire and the standing off, but uh, we are not trying to avoid the stent and uh, uh, at least uh, we are trying to minimize the stent length even after succeeding the long CTO. And uh, so uh, hopefully the ballooning is uh, impossible for these kind of regions, but uh, hopefully ballooning is uh, the best solution at this moment. Just a crowd come and uh, try not to uh, stand. That's my strategy. Uh, how about Ida? You, you, you can try it interluminally or subinternally? So I, I, I initially used the subinternal approach for using the O3-5 wire. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, in this yeah. case, the, this region, the task B, it's, it's very difficult to avoid the stent implantation. So maybe the, in this case, we initially treated with stent from O3 to this part of SFA. Because the vessel diameter is good and the runoff is good, so uh, I, we expect a good parency after stent implantation in this type of case. So, which is stent, bare-metal or DA? Uh, mm. I think the bare-metal is enough to, to obtain the good parency in this type of case. How about the TV? It is possible in Japan. I know no, not TV is not Japan. available, not but available if Japan. TV is available, what do you think about TV in the, this kind of SFA? Unfortunately, in Japan, the TV is not available. Mm -hmm. If possible, so we, we avoid the stent implantation, even though this type of wrong total occlusion. And uh, I, I know also Dr. Garcia has a lot of experience of uh, acerectomy. It is, so, what do you think about that, I mean, this kind of long CTO SFA? Well, I think that uh, the only d data we have is from, from definitive, and definitive, uh, you know, our CTO uh, uh, rate was relatively low, it was about 20%, but the long lesion subset at about 15 centimeters had a 65, 67% primary patency with a PSVR of 2.4. Uh, in this respect, I think that um, the combination of drug-coated balloon with atherectomy, trying to, again, with Dr. Professor Yokoi uh, had described of leaving nothing behind, seems to make intuitive sense. Uh, the challenge is, is that this specific type of lesion, particularly when it encroaches on the profunda, nobody's really uh, studied very well, and I suspect that a combination of an endoprosthesis uh, uh, or an atherectomy balloon uh, a drug-coated balloon seems to be the, the really diametric uh, ways of treating this that has yet to be studied. But in my experience, I think if you did atherectomy uh, with the idea of a, of a drug-coated balloon, it seems to make sense to then come back and fight another day with a failure mode, uh, which should be restenotic and not have anything left behind. What would your thoughts yeah, be about atherectomy if, we, if you were confident that you were subintimal majority of the way? Yeah, I think that's always a big problem, particularly if you, as you know, you're probably going to be crossing this in a supplemental plane. Um, I think that uh, getting a lumen uh, that is reasonable uh, is all the, the intent here rather than really trying to debulk beyond, you know, a 50 percent black volume residual. And I think if you can get that, uh, even with a subintimal approach, you probably have uh, a fairly good chance that you will not create a major perforation. Again, back to definitive, the, the definitive's biggest complication rate was perforation at about 5.4 percent. So I think that that is something that uh, definitely needs to be stated, and I think your point is well taken. And uh, one last question about atherectomy. What about embolic protection? Would you, uh, if we were to embark on uh, atherectomy here, uh, would you uh, always use embolic protection selectively or never? I was a huge believer in distal protection uh, prior to Definitive. Definitive had a 20 percent embolic protection rate um, with only a 3 percent embolic event. Uh, so I think that of the 80 percent that did not get distal protection, it seemed like it was irrelevant. I think those patients that really require distal protection are those that are either thrombotic uh, rather than ather uh, atherotic, uh, you know, uh, more with atheroma, um, or those with heavy calcification, and then ultimately single vessel runoff. I think this 
runoff looks relatively good. I don't think that you need distal protection for if you were going to choose atherectomy uh, with a directional source. Fair enough. So, uh, you know, a lot of different options here, balloon only, drug wooding balloon, uh, stenting, stenting the entire thing, stenting just part of it, atherectomy alone, atherectomy followed by DEB. Uh, it's good that we have so many choices. Uh, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, unless there's any other comments from uh, the moderators of the panel? Well, this is Michael Jaff. The only other comment I would make is that uh, the only literature that's looked at this, other than a surgical revascularization, a lesion this long, is with the Viabon device. Uh, and the Vibrin trial took lesions this long, and they randomized them to a uh, covered stent versus bare metal stent. And the results were dismal no matter which arm you used. The only advantage to the Viabon device was that the restenosis rates were more edge restenosis than long, diffuse, instant restenosis. So if you're going to practice based on the literature only, Lawrence, I think that's the only literature we have for a lesion like this. Yeah, I think, yeah you're quoting uh, uh, Vibrant and then Viper as a single arm study had a better outcome and Viastar better. Uh, but the, the challenge has always been this idea of covering these collaterals on the outflow, which is, you know, a, a potential uh, problem, particularly if a failure mode is thrombotic. And even though the trials didn't necessarily show that that was... to cover the distal collateral. So uh, I would think the Biobron, uh, application of Biobron have to be very careful because uh, Biobron, you have to close uh, distal collateral. So uh, I think uh, beer, beer or either DS or stent is uh, much better for uh, distal portion of the collateral source. Yeah, even though the trials didn't show uh, an acute occlusion rate, uh, but resulting in acute uh, limb ischemia in the trials, that's always a concern, especially with this anatomy here where there's one large collateral that seems to be reconstituting. So I'd be a little concerned about uh, vibe on here. Um, Dr. Park, any comments, any thoughts? Mm, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. And maybe what we'll do is we'll cross the lesion, see how well we can cross it, how easily we cross it. And then based on that, we can uh, decide how to treat. We may need a re-entry device. We may not, and we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. We've started, uh, elected to go with the 035 wire. Uh, this is a Terumo stiff angle glide, along with an 035 support catheter. This is the Rubicon by Boston Scientific. Uh, and, and we'll start with that. Other uh, modalities, other uh, combinations are possible as well. This is what we've decided to go with. As I get started, if any, anybody on the panel or moderators have any specific thing that they would rather use uh, with this. And there's all sorts. There's all sorts of uh, different devices you can use. I, I use the uh, the Wildcat sometimes in cases like this. Um, okay. I've used uh, 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 catheters like you've uh, used. Uh, there are a bunch of devices out there. There's the uh, Bridgepoint device. Um, the Vion device. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to take a, a DSA image here and then put this onto a smart mask and get started. Rick, uh, as you go down the road of these CTO devices, um, any any uh, experience with the Wildcat's uh, uh, OCT fiber device? Is it useful in crossing these CTOs? Is it useful to stay luminal versus subintimal? What's it's, your experience? It's useful. It's useful, uh, Lawrence, to get started in the true lumen. Um, and we've utilized it, got in the, in the true lumen. Sometimes we switch to uh, the wildcat once we're in the true lumen over a couple centimeters, and the case goes very quickly, um, and you stay in the true lumen. So I, I've been happy with that, but um, looks like you're going where you want to go. Yeah. Luckily, there's a, a nub here, uh, a very favorable nub. Yeah. Uh, and it could be a lot worse. It could have been a flush occlusion. could have been a blunt occlusion. <laughs> right. so. Yes, the gods are favoring this, at least, at least uh, so far. So what I, I like to do here is a typical technique of trying to get a J early and keep the J narrow. Uh, it's a tried and tested technique. It works well. Uh, and if it starts to get too broad, then I know I'm definitely in the wrong spot. But uh, for now, it seems to be going pretty smoothly, consistent with no calcium. And, okay. So. Taking out to straight AP. Uh, 
it's nice that you're utilizing changing the angle and so forth. And, and you don't have to go super fast. You're going the correct uh, speed. I'm really sure it looks like you're, you're so far doing well. Your loop's not too large. So let's go into it's interesting as we look DSC at this case, well. unlike anything in coronary intervention, we're, everybody on the panel has already accepted the fact there will be a failure mode. In other words, the patient probably will restenose, and that if you want to look forward in terms of how you're going to treat that restenosis, vocally stent with a drug eluding stent, drug eluding balloon, or a uh, covered stent, whatever, because realizing that uh, uh, unless you can get this patient to stop smoking and exercising, where even if it restenosis, he may not have symptoms, um, we're not going to change his uh, overall arteriosclerotic problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think everybody's been commenting on moving away from the stem to stern stenting strategy because you get great results. You feel good when it's a procedure is done acutely, <laughs> but six, seven months down the line, yeah, not so much. That's getting a little bit uh, wide here, but I'm going to keep going because it's going pretty smoothly. And what I'm going to try to do is, as I get about two centimeters above this reconstitution point, I'm going to take the J away and try to. See if I can get are you concerned your loop's a little big, or are you feeling yeah. pretty good? No, it got a little bit bigger down uh, as I went halfway down to SFA. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if I, I could have pulled back and made it smaller again, but it was going very smoothly. I think you, yeah, it looks smooth. Right, so, uh, Which are there any special techniques to minimize the dissection and uh, entry the DSA? I, I think the main thing is using a hydrophilic catheter. As Ravish is doing here, I think that's uh, beneficial. So I think it's important once you get to this point to really take a high mag image of it, put it under a smart mask or roadmap, and then gently try to make your way into the true lumen. Even if you're sub intima here, majority of times you can actually find the true lumen. So we'll see if that happens here, but this is where you don't want to be aggressive and just push it through. Correct. It's interesting, a case like this with the reentry devices as well as the fact that this is an, uh, a fairly straightforward case to go popliteal or uh, pedal. I usually don't go pedal unless there's critical limb ischemia, but um, to some extent you can be relatively aggressive knowing you can do that. Mm. That's looking good. Yeah, I think if it was a total flush occlusion at the uh, SFA, CFA, yeah. there we go. That's looking Excellent. very good. Excellent. Good job. Yeah. And then obviously we want to make sure that we're actually in true limit, not just assume that. Uh, I'm going to take a little picture here with the wire out. Sure. Hi, jump to it. Picture. This is another good example of uh, cost containment. You know, a, I don't know, a hundred dollar wire and a catheter composed as opposed to a several thousand dollar piece of equipment to cross CTOs. This, that was excellent technique. Yes, absolutely. Ravish, if you show us a shot that uh, shows you're in the distal vessel, we may go to the other room because uh, it sounds like you don't need our help at all and you're doing a fantastic job. <laughs> Got a non-calcified, straightforward SFA. Uh, and it's still DSA a long points. lesion. Very good. You made it look very easy. There we go. Good. We're happy on this end. I'm sure you're happy on your end. Yeah, so uh, I think we'll uh, try to figure out what to do over here, uh, balloon it gently, and then uh, maybe when you guys come back, we'll uh, see what the final result looks like. Okay, let's go to the other room, uh, I believe, with uh, Dr. Baird. There we are. Oh, hi, Rich. John, we see you loud and clear. Great, and I hear you loud and clear. Uh, welcome to uh, the hybrid OR, uh, room number five. I'm uh, joined by Dr. Sungho Her and uh, Dr. Park uh, from uh, Asan uh, Medical Center. And uh, what we're going to try and demonstrate for you today is an endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. This is uh, case number 1-1. One, uh, one. Uh, so the patient is a 71-year-old man who was admitted for treatment of this asymptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysm, which was found during a routine health exam. 
the CT scan showed a maximal transverse diameter of six centimeters uh, with a, an adequate uh, infrarenal aortic neck. There's some uh, tortuosity of the aorta, aorta which you'll see, and uh, very short uh, common iliac arteries, which makes this uh, case challenging with ectasia of the right common iliac artery extending right down to the bifurcation, most pronounced on the CT scan. Uh, his past medical history is positive for dyslipidemia, history of atrial fibrillation, uh, but no prior MI or uh, cabbage. Next slide, please. And the, I don't know if you're seeing the slides, Rich, but uh, his other uh, comorbidities are just the hyperlipidemia that we talked about in the AFib. Yeah, yeah. Next slide. In terms of the evaluation to date, uh, he had a uh, CT scan done with about uh, three millimeter cuts which I reviewed uh, yesterday. It showed the six uh, centimeter sized uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm with an infrarenal neck which uh, has reverse taper. There's about a centimeter and a half of uh, constant diameter, then it uh, fans out to an another centimeter and a half of larger diameter. Next uh, slide. Uh, in terms of his other medications, he's on digoxin, valsartan, and has been taking aspirin. Next slide. So uh, the plan for today was, uh, okay, we'll have a CT scan we can show you here. Uh, these are the <laughs> axial images scanning down from top to bottom. There's the uh, celiac trunk, the SMA, renal vein, now the right and left renal arteries. Then we see a nice segment and then it enlarges and then we get into the aneurysm which is quite large as you can see close to six centimeters in this uh, uh, measurement. And as we scan down, you'll see the right common iliac artery is aneurysmal and very short, really no decent landing zone on the right common iliac artery, mm. but then decent diameters uh, for the uh, uh, external iliac arteries for access in terms of the device delivery. John, two things. Uh, obviously, the left renal artery is a lot lower. Um, boy, it looks as if you're going to have to cover probably both internals. I mean, am I, am I wrong? Well, I can tell you the plan was to, to cross the right internal and close it and to try yeah. and land in the left common uh, proximal to the iliac bifurcation. No. We should have maybe a couple centimeters of landing zone on the, on the left side. Uh, any other comments from the panel before we kind of launch into uh, what we've done so far? Well, it looks as if um, the site where you're going to place your main device is going to be, um, I presumably, on the right side. Correct. And so uh, Dr. Park and the team here uh, got access for me prior to arrival. Uh, and they uh, did uh, pre-closed technique with two per-closed proglide catheters and then inserted uh, six, uh, eight French sheaths into the right and left common femoral arteries. So the plan was to do totally percutaneous EVAR with a right femoral um, access for our primary uh, deployment of the device. And then after arrival here, we went ahead and uh, crossed over from the left side and put a six French sheath into the internal iliac artery and deployed a 12 millimeter uh, Amplatz II plug in the the right internal iliac artery uh, prior to, uh, to crossing over as part of our stent graft procedure. So I'm going to show you, are you seeing any of the fluoroscopic images here, Rich? We sure are. So that was the angiogram that was done. Let me just show you the femoral shots. Dr. Park did a beautiful job here, got access to uh, the mid-common femoral artery on the right side, and also a nice access on the left side. Uh, the upper third of the common femoral artery. Both femorals appear to be healthy. You can see now with an IMA from the left uh, femoral approach over the top that the right common iliac is very ectatic and short. And we see a large diameter uh, internal iliac artery that's patent. So I advanced a hydrophilic guide wire into the internal iliac artery, brought the IMA catheter over that wire into the internal iliac artery. Next. Uh, and uh, then we uh, exchanged the uh, 
hydrophilic wire for an amplet, super stiff wire, and then brought in our sheath over the amplet, super stiff wire into the internal iliac artery. Next. So now we have a six French sheath in from the contralateral access. This is it coming around. I might add, as you're doing this, there's nothing more fun in life than coiling internal iliacs. It's just my fault. I think, you do a uh, lot of them radially. I think you have a perverted sense of fun. But, I think uh, I do. I think I do. And I so uh, we actually, in this case, didn't coil, but we deployed a 12-millimeter diameter amplats to plug. Uh, and that was based on the CT measurements where the internal looked yeah. about 9 to 10 millimeters. We did an angiogram afterwards. There's still plenty of flow in the internal iliac, but that's not surprising since the patient's heparin eyes. Yeah, you can see that it's nicely matched diameter-wise. So looks good. I think that's fine in terms of our, our goal of occluding the internal iliac and preventing retrograde flow. So then we went ahead and uh, advanced the wire up into the aorta and brought our pigtail up for an, our, our initial aortogram, which uh, shows the anatomy, a fair amount of tortuosity of the abdominal aorta, uh, a, a reverse taper of the inferenal aortic neck with not a whole lot of room uh, below the left renal before it dilates, and then the short common iliac arteries that we talked about. So we sized our stent graft based on that larger diameter of the inferenal neck to try and be able to seal and cross the entire length. So we're going to use a 28 millimeter diameter endurant uh, graft from Medtronic. Uh, I need to get access from the right side to get our uh, stiff wire up to allow uh, for passage of the device. So I'm going to ask Dr. Hur if he can advance that hydrophilic guide wire up from below. As you saw, there's a fair amount of tortuosity. I'm going to pull the sheet back just a little bit to help him. <clears throat> and then uh, we'll follow up with our catheter. And then we'll change for uh, an amplat super stiff wire once we get this up. Maybe I'll have you pull that wire back and just get it all the way up there if you can, Dr. Hart. Okay, John, terrific. obviously you just met this patient today. Um, do you forewarn your patients when you're coiling one side about a little hip, hip claudication they sometimes will have? Yeah, usually the usually they get buttock uh, claudication, and yeah. uh, I wouldn't shouldn't say usually. Almost always they'll get buttock claudication, right. and we'll tell them that it's going to be there, but it'll likely get better over time, which it almost always does. Yeah. So now You're we're right. going to switch. It looks like the left side's clear uh, in terms of being able to get a seal. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, at that common iliac on that left side, it looks like it's fairly non-diseased, but you're going to have to be correct on your length. Obviously. Yeah, and that's the reason for going primary from the right, because we can take a long right. device and uh, go ahead and uh, run it down into the external on the right side, and then we can be more precise on the left side. So now we have our uh, Amplatz wire up into the uh, descending thoracic aorta. So we'll go ahead and take our stent graft, and this is going to be the uh, 28 millimeter diameter with a 13 uh, limb on the right side and 181 uh, centimeters long total length. So go ahead and open that if you would. And so we'll come up from the yeah. right side. We'll dilate the femoral artery first with a couple of dilators. John, this is John. So this patient left common leg is enough to. Uh, O over it looks over two centimeters, but if the left common area is also short, uh, do you consider sandwich technique? I'm sorry, I missed the last uh, bit about that. Uh, would we consider what? Sandwich technique. If it left common area is uh, short, less than uh, two centimeters. To stent into the internal. Uh, to try and uh, have a, a, a bifurcated graft? Uh, is that the question? Is that what you mean? I think that's the question, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, there's a lot of talking in the lab here, so I'm having a little trouble hearing, but uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I think we're going to be able to seal here fine. If we can't seal with, uh, with this uh, graft, I think then we could conceivably put a balloon expandable stent inside of it to get a, a better apposition and I think we'll be okay. 
but we are going to have to be careful. So now we're dilating the femoral artery up here a little bit with a 14 and then a 16 uh, dilator. Let's look on 4 here real quick. Our wire is still good. Okay, great. Okay, we can come on out. But that is, that's a good question in terms of how you would address this bifurcation if we don't get a seal, and that'll certainly be a challenge. So uh, many of you are, I think, familiar with the Medtronic Endurant uh, graft. It's a modulator, mod modular bifurcated uh, graft with one docking limb. has a suprarenal stent with attachment hooks. It's got a hydrophilic coating, which we're going to wet now. And we're going we're gonna to want to uh, have our limb uh, probably that way. Yeah, great. So we're going to do a kind of a traditional approach in terms of the uh, de deployment of the uh, contralateral limb. So that's going very nicely through the, uh, the femoral site. And we're going to just follow it up now. We might actually go right through the loop of that pigtail because I think the wire actually went through it. So I'm going to have to kind of do something with that pigtail. I might have to advance the pigtail back up because it's kind of looped right around the graft, actually, as it turns out. There we go. Now, we're going to uh, be paying attention to the mark on the lower part of the graft, which we're going to, let's mag up if we could, which we're going to, again, want to orient towards the left side and somewhat anterior, if we can. And once we get things in position, we'll do a little bit of an angiogram here. 20 for 20, please. 20, 20? Yeah, great. So we'll do an angiogram here and check our, our position. Inject. So we're way high. Better to start high than low. Absolutely. And uh, can we roadmap, please? So we'll get a roadmap just to kind of help a little bit with our positioning. I must admit that is a huge difference between the height of the left renal and the right renal. Yeah, it makes represent. it a little bit uh, tougher yeah. for us. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get down to about the renal where we can then potentially start our deployment. It's a very nice delivery system with the Medtronic graft. So uh, yeah. let's go ahead and take it off roadmap. No, no roadmap? No. And we'll center a little bit more. And I'm also going to put a little cranial angulation to try and get a little bit more per perpendicular to the graft as we start deploying. Okay, and so cranial ablation is important here. So we'll go ahead and start. Uh, we'll we'll release the first couple of rings just to get started, and then we'll do another angiogram. So it's a simple rotation of the handle. You can see the sheath coming down a little bit now. The ring on the tip of the sheath. So we'll deploy about two segments of the graft here. And then let's do another run here just to confirm that we're happy with things. So we are still high. Can we roadmap? Roadmap is helpful here. Noise pull down. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna, I am going to come down a little bit. That's settling in pretty nicely. And then we're going to deploy some more here. <clears throat> John, are you like me? I really prefer the super renal fixation, don't you? Yeah, for, for almost all cases, Rich. Okay, yeah. let's take a uh, roadmap off. And do we have a J-wire? Yeah. 
So we're going to deploy down to the opening of the contralateral limb. You can see the marker there for that. Okay, so it just popped open. Yeah. And now we're going to do another run just to, again, one more time confirm our position. Ready? So I think we need to come down maybe two millimeters. Yeah. Roadmap, please. I like our position relative to the uh, bifurcation and everything else yes, so far. Yeah. And you'll have control of that common iliac on that left side. I got ahead of the team here uh, in terms of things. <laughs> so I, I will say again, I've said this many times, but it's a tremendous pleasure to work at Asan Medical Center. The team here is just superb, and uh, the help that you get when you're doing live cases is really uh, unparalleled. Uh, it's really a great uh, pleasure to be here with the team again. So I think that's good there. Okay, uh, roadmap off. And we'll take, uh, now we're going to take the pigtail down so we don't jail the pigtail. Uh, J-wire? Wire. Oh, wire? wire. So John was already anticipating going up with a J-wire and, and yeah, going the into pigtail. the contralateral limb then. You always want to plan ahead and tell people what you're going to need. So before we deploy suprarenal stent, I'm just going to get the pigtail out of there. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Like that. Okay. So now the next step is really just to uh, deploy the uh, the suprarenal stent. And um, if we can focus on my hands, there's a little knob here at the back, which we turn, rotate, which will then release that suprarenal stent. It nicely has an arrow on it, so it's practically dummy proof. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that now, and you'll see the suprarenal stent pop open. Are you seeing floral well, Rich? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and re release here. Okay. And I'm just going to keep rotating up and just so it's clear of the graph. See how that stent opened up? Yes. That's good. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and leave uh, the rest of the main body undeployed, and then we're going to take a catheter up and try and get into the, the contralateral uh, gate. And this is a JR4. So we'll start with a JR4. We might need something with a little bit more hook to it. We'll see. Hopefully this will do it. So got one. Okay, you want to try that for a little while there? Do we have a torquer? Uh, okay, no. no, come down yeah, a little bit lower. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the key point here is to uh, make sure you're inside rather than behind the graft. That looks promising. Mm -hmm. Okay, out the key kidney, so we... Uh, We'll pass up through there. Thank you. So now as I advance that JR4 catheter, I feel a catch on the graft a little bit. So we're going to just take the wire back, and we're going to spin this around a little bit and confirm that we're happy with uh, us being in the, inside the graft. And then I'll take a little syringe of contrast. Your team is making this look very easy. Sometimes getting that gate is not that quick. Just a syringe of contrast? That was very good. Contrast? Some of us use pigtails to twist it around here just to make sure. It, it's imperative to know that you're in the true lumen rather than the posterior portion. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Hurd did a nice job there. It looked like he was in the right place from the get-go, but we yeah. will confirm. I'm going to mag up just a little bit uh, here to make sure. Oops. Yeah, one more. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do a little city here. 
Yeah, so I think that's pretty clear, huh? Looks good. Yeah. Okay, we'll take the Amplat Square now. Or uh, whatever this is. This uh, Amplat or Lindequist? Lindequist. Mm -hmm. Okay. We use a lot of stiff wires in deploying the interluminal graphs. It really makes it a lot easier. Okay. And so we'll just check and verify our wires up above are not around the arch. We'd like them to stay out of the arch if at all possible. We don't want to have any s unnecessary strokes. Okay, so we're going to take the marker pigtail back. So here's the part that we have to really be precise with, Rich, is, uh, yeah. is uh, making sure that we have the right length from the top of the gate to the origin of the uh, internal iliac. So I'll take the markers up right, line them up right with that mark that's at the top of the gate there. See that? Yep. And yes. now we're going to center and we're going to do an angiogram through the sheath. And then I'll take a syringe of contrast. No, that's okay. You can leave the one. Syringe of contrast. So we'll do a retrograde sheath angiogram to see the internal iliac. And then we can pick the length graph that we want to use. Okay, so retrograde and Joe here. Okay, so let's stop stop the image when it's full, if we can. So uh, I'm seeing uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sonometers yes okay so we'll take a 93 uh, limb 16 diameter based on our CT measurements and uh, very good we'll take that and so now we can uh, take the uh, pigtail out so everybody follow that rich so we're basically yes yeah. using the marker yeah. pigtail from the top of the landing zone to the internal iliac to pick the length graft. And now, um, can, I, can I have a road map from the previous run? John did a great presentation yesterday talking about the uh, importance of the preoperative CT. It really dictates most of what we do. The last, um, the last run, can we do a road map from? Oh, okay. Um, but this is imperative to know this diameter and this length. And we'll need a dilator too. Uh, can we use a dilator, uh, one dilator? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, oh. you can always overlap in this uh, gate, the contralateral gate. Okay. Okay. okay, so we're just dilating up uh, with this one dilator. Okay. Great. And then we'll go ahead and take the uh, 16 uh, by 93 contralateral limb. It's hydrophilic, so I'm going to wet it before we go in. But like a lot of hydrophilic things, it's sticky when it's dry and it's extremely sip, slippery when it's wet, which makes it great for. Uh... So we got our road map, which will help us immensely here. Now that's going to be close. I'm going to probably cheat down just a little bit. We want to have at least. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. want to have at least two centi two and a half rings of overlap which we yeah. have. I think we're actually in pretty good shape here. It looks good. What's the panel think? Is everybody okay with us? Everybody happy with that overlap? Yeah, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, we like it, John. Okay, I got the go-ahead from the Medtronic uh, rep who's with us too. <laughs> exactly. 
The more eyes, the better. Exactly. So we're going to deploy here now. It came back just a hair. I'm going to advance it just the tiniest bit. Again, you can always pull back. It's a little bit more difficult to advance it, so he doesn't want to deploy it completely yet. So it's a rotating mechanism, and then when you're comfortable with what you have, then you can go ahead and slide it back. So we'll go ahead and slide and deploy the rest of it. Let's take a roadmap off so everybody can see that. So good, I'm happy with that. So now we're going to bring back the dilator or the introducer back to the sheath before we come out. And we're going to go ahead and replace that with what do we have for a sheath to plug in the hole? Do we have uh, a 12 sheath? Uh, we need a 14 sheath? 14 sheath. Okay, so we'll, we'll plug the hole with a 14 sheath. There. After that, yes. The, the other room uh, advanced the case, so we, we, we're going to move to the other room and uh, come back again. Okay, okay, great. Well, we'll see you back in just a little bit. Great, John. Okay, thank you. See you, Ravish. Hey, guys. Um, that was a great case that uh, John's doing there. Um, so I'm going to take us back to... Uh, all right, so this is where we left off last time. Uh, we had crossed, and then we took a picture uh, showing that we were intraluminal. And we had a few choices ahead of us, as we had discussed earlier. And because of uh, this concern about long stents and potential risk of restenosis and the, the uh, problems treating that, we decided to go with atherectomy and drug looting balloon. Uh, it's not um, proven. Uh, data. Hopefully, in the next couple of years, we'll know if that option is better than drug leading balloon alone and in long lesions. Uh, we don't know right now. So we decided to move forward with that. We uh, did deploy a filter. Uh, just to, we had talked about that earlier. My concern was with the large amount of plaque. Um, uh, unclear if there's any, going to be any thrombus in there since I don't know the patient, don't know the length of his symptoms. Um, I decided to just have some insurance, put a filter in there. Uh, that's a six millimeter spider. Uh, really anything with an 014 wire would work. And then we started with a, a, a Silverhawk uh, LXM device. Uh, this is the one with the long nose cone, uh, hopefully minimizing the number of passes I have to do. And uh, to a total of just uh, three runs. Um, all the way down. And here is what it looks like, approximately. And so is this just after atherectomy? Just after atherectomy, nothing else after that. That's a pretty that. good result. And it's a nice lumen size. And the reconstitution was at 8 centimeter mark over there, so there's still some disease yeah. there. So I went back in and did an atherectomy there, just in the last three or four centimeters. And I have a little bit of a fistula there, okay, right there. No perf, just a fistula. So I'm going to stop there and just get the moderator and the panel's opinion on what we should do next. Uh, we've already moved forward with one option, but I wanted to get people's thoughts on uh, how to proceed here. What does everybody think? Would you do the drug eluting balloon? Would you place a stent, a covered stent? Any ideas? As I mentioned, this is a very good diameter. Yeah. I like that. You know, in the U.S., we don't have the, uh, you know, commercial availability of drug-coated balloons. So at this point, again, particularly since it's a long CTO, we would end up having to bail out to long balloon inflation for a period of time. But understanding that the restenosis rate was relatively high, we would probably stent. And here we would, you know, hedge your bets. You could stent just the outflow, which is where the, uh, the challenge is. Sure. Uh, or, uh, and then just do balloon angioplasty to the rest of it, or run the whole thing with a drug eluting stent up to the par a portion that's proximal to the SFA and then just do balloon and angioplasty there. Again, I think it would be really nice to have the data set from definitive AR to know what drug eluting balloon did with atherectomy here. I guess if it was available, I'd probably use it in this case all the time, wouldn't you, Lawrence? Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's an attractive uh, yeah. approach. 
Uh, and then again, it leaves you know the opportunity for restenosis to to be failure, uh, but with no endoprosthesis in place. Right. That's probably the biggest attraction is, is that nothing's left in there. Right. This, this is a very nice case for uh, DB because of the DB data of SFA is very nice compared to the simple bone endoprosthesis. So I think the after uh, acerectomy and that there are minimal dissections, so I think the uh, acerectomy plus DB is a, be a very good option of this kind of uh, the long uh, SFCTO. But uh, um, and also without uh, heavy calcification. But uh, silver is uh, not good option for heavy calcified SFA. But this patient is. Uh, uh, minimal classification, so I think that uh, acerectomy plus TB is a very good option for long CTO SFA. Any concerns from uh, the panel about this uh, fistula right there that was created with atherectomy uh, very distal in there? I don't, I don't think so, just on, uh, yeah. on face value of it. Um, I, yeah, we see it a lot. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. yeah I agree. So I think there seems to be a consensus here that DB would be a good option, and we're all encouraged by the impact SFA data. Um, so that's what we went forward with. Now, this is uh, admittedly an expensive case now, right? It's a, we have a filter, we have an atherectomy <laughs> device, <laughs> we have a, a few wires, and then these balloons only come in certain lengths. Uh, so here's a first one. This is the Medtronic drug loading balloon, 5 by 120. We did a 60 second inflation there. This is the next one, another 5 by 120. And we haven't done the third one yet. It's loaded up, but uh, we're about to uh, put that in. So I'm going to go ahead and advance that. And uh, then we'll see what it looks like. Uh, a question for the panel Would anybody have uh, pre treated this um, area with a, a regular balloon uh, before going in with the drug loading balloon? Or is that threat to me enough to prep the SFA? But uh, in this uh, cost uh, containment error, so uh, filter, atrectomy, D, DV, and might stand. It's a, it's, it's a practical approach for the everyday practice. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the one piece of, of this puzzle that we still have not heard will be uh, if, in fact, this is an approach that works, it has to work not only in the acute phase, but also in the long-term phase. So if the failure mode on restenosis is, you know, laser or some other device, then the cost assessment later on may catch up with the upfront cost. But, again, I think we're, we're speculating a lot about that. Um, but I think the point is, is exceedingly well taken. That, you know, you take a very simple case and made it very expensive. Um, but it's really looking at that next domino to fall, which is restenosis or the failure mode, which allows you to retreat. Yeah, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. And this was done more just to, I guess, showcase a particular strategy. I don't think this is a viable strategy at this point, at least for most hospitals in the U.S., even once DV gets available. Uh, the, the cost of an atherectomy device plus a filter, uh, that's debatable whether to use one, plus a DB is... Um, is prohibitive. Uh, maybe our industry partners will consider bundling uh, or have some kind of a strategy that will not be so expensive, but at least for now, uh, I don't know if this is something that's doable on a regular basis. And, and you know, back to your original question about pretreatment, I think that, you know, Impact certainly had a pretreatment uh, strategy, had to predilate to get the, the drug in there. Here with, with atherectomy, you probably expose the the target of your therapy, which is the media, uh, so that the pockets of paclitaxel are, uh, or packets of paclitaxel are actually deployed in the place you want them. But I, I think it's a very, it, it seems like a sexy approach here. I just don't know, to your point, I just don't know if it's, it's very cost prohibitive unless there's a cost benefit analysis that shows it later to be beneficial. Lawrence, you've done a lot of atherectomy. Let me just ask you, uh, in what you saw after atherectomy in this lesion, could you have theoretically only treated that distal lesion with a drug coated balloon and then either left the proximal aspect alone after atherectomy or used a bare balloon? 
I, yeah, I think that's, a, Michael, I think that's a good question. I think that for us, the outflow is critical just because that's where most of this, you, you could see the difficulty of, of how it looked. Uh, the middle, I think, is, is um, you know, just a deep wall cut. I think you were more adventitial there, but I think that the outcome would probably be safe there. But again, very limited data to support that. I would tend to lean towards a drug coated balloon at the origin as well as the exit just to hedge my bets. Uh, but it does increase your overall costs. I think you can still do a plain balloon uh, for POBA upstream as well, because I think that entry seemed to be pre relatively preserved. But I, I think there are a whole series. I mean, you can skin this cat about a million different ways to do proximal mid and distal, or just proximal and outflow, or just outflow alone. And what I just did here what was, uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, there was, um, uh, we used three balloons here, again, very expensive. But there was still a little space left between the second and third one, so I just used the last balloon to go down a little bit further and just use that as a potentially a bare balloon or with minimal drug effect to cover that area rather than go with the fourth. Uh, you know, the temptation is good data is starting to come out now. Uh, impact, Levant's going to come out, Definitive's out, Silver, PTX, longer term data is coming out, a number of drug coated balloons some bioresorbable devices. The temptation is, of course, to compare the results of one to another, right? And so here, you could say, well, if you took the only the distal aspect of the lesion, treated that with an impact balloon, that would be an impact patient, right? And then you know what that result is. Compare that to a single or silver drug eluting stent in that same location, you could say, you know what that result is, but you can't do that. And, and so we're still left with the struggle of practicing based on evidence base. Basically saying exactly what we've been chiming on for for so long is now we need co direct comparator trials, you know, among among devices. What a great advantage of using the atherectomy, specifically the Silverhawk, uh, is at that origin of the SFA, so you don't get the plaque shift that you would have gotten with other technologies. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. So we see this little area. So I uh, went on a little higher mag here at the uh, distal reentry point because there's, uh, there was some concern over there. And there does appear to be a, a small dissection there, uh, maybe about uh, 15 millimeters linear. Uh, thoughts of the panel on what to do with this, if anything? Oh. Well, it looks like a perfect result. So. Well, it's not flow limiting. What I probably would use, and I don't know its effect on the drug eluting balloon, would be to use a focus type balloon, an angioscore, a chocolate balloon to, quote, seal that off. But uh, um, if we start stenting this, and again, it gets expensive. Heck, yeah. even with the angioscore, it's pretty expensive. But uh, um, I guess you could sit on it. What do you think, panel? Leave it. Actually, the dissection is not flow limiting, and uh, in Korean DV data, the bailout stenting after DV is less than 15, uh, 14%. So I think it, it looks very nice. So we don't uh, need it, uh, an additional bailout stenting. I'm leaning towards the same way. I think we'll just leave this alone. I'll take a picture further down, make sure the filter is okay, get that out, and take a look at it. Um, Sounds good. I don't fault the filter. You must have uh, obtained a lot of plaque. Okay. DSA. Did you remove a lot of plaque? Uh, uh, yeah, we removed a lot of plaque. Uh, we'll show you that in just a moment from the uh, SFA. And the filter we're going to find in just a moment here. All right, so it looks good there. Let's get the filter retrieval, please. Retrieval. In the meantime, can we uh, show the, um, the plaque that we removed, maybe on camera? Uh, I think there was a question about that.
Hey, Rich. Yes. What's, uh, am I the only one who's looking at that proximal posterior tibial artery? Is there something there? I don't know. I can't tell if it looked that way before here. I'm going to get this um, filter out of here, and then I'm going to take a closer look at that. You know, I'm the non-invasive guy, so you should put the least amount of credence in what I said. Or the most. That's the person that placed the most credence on the yeah, elastic. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. May just be branches over each other. I think so. In a different angle. Yeah, it just didn't look like it's probably a different angle, that's all. That's, a, that's a right there. Yeah, I think that's a yeah, branch. Yeah, that's fine. I think it looks okay. I don't, uh, there's, uh, there's some plaque there that's eccentric, but I don't think there's, yeah. it doesn't look like thrombus. And then there's a branch uh, overlapping it. Yeah. Okay. And anything in the filter? Let's take a look at that. He's a lucky smoker for not having any infrapopliteal disease. Boy. So we have a little bit of plaque at the very tip of the spider. Um, it's not chock full of plaque, but there clearly is some plaque over there. I don't know if the way we can zoom in on this. What else is yeah, the anatomy is somewhat interesting, too. It's just unilateral disease. The other side looks fairly clear. It tends to suggest something, you know, I don't know, some ulceration which would progress over time. I don't know if that's visible to uh, you guys there. There's some small plaque there at the very end. Yeah, small yeah, pledge it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Any other comments? Thoughts? Looks very good. Well, thank you. Um, it's an honor for me to be here, and, uh, and uh, thank you, the panel, for, uh, for their, their, their questions, their comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parkin. job. Thank you for the excellent thank you. presentation. Thank you. John, we're seeing you. Hey, Rich. Hi. Let me do one thing, and we'll resume the conversation. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, welcome back, by the way. We uh, went ahead and deployed, uh, you know, both uh, limbs of the graft. Uh, we put in the uh, contralateral limb down into the common. Uh, I think it uh, ended up in a pretty good place. Uh, then we went ahead and completed deployment of uh, the graft, the main body of the graft, down into the right external iliac artery. I think it extended a couple centimeters beyond the origin of the uh, internal iliac artery. And then we went ahead and uh, removed the graft, uh, or removed the main body, which we're showing there. You can see as we, we first capture the, uh, the nose cone, and then we'll bring it down through the graft without any difficulties. Next. And then we did a little angiogram uh, retrograde showing that we were you know, into the external pretty well. You can see the size differential there. Next. And then went ahead and ballooned up uh, the different uh, attachment sites here approximately with a reliant balloon. Next. And then a little bit more approximately. Next. And then into that more dilated segment. Next. And then down through the limb, right down to the, uh, keep going forward, uh, right down to that distal aspect. So we dilated all the way down to the end. And then went ahead and put the balloon up the other side. And again, dilated proximally and distally. And at the, at the, uh, in the gate with the uh, connection of the contralateral limb and the main body is seen here. And then all the way down to the distal end. Next. And then we went ahead and did an angiogram, which we'll show you now, which shows really nice position at the level of the renal arteries. But it looks like we got a little bit of an endo leak, you know, distally. You can see that tiny bit of contrast in the distal part of the aneurysm sac. Yes. I think we're good on the right side. You see a lot of tortuosity or, you know, pseudo lesions created by the stiff wire in the external iliac. 
we have a good position with our limb down to just above the bifurcation on the left side. But we, I think we have a little bit of a, an endoleak, and it may be a type 1B from the distal attachment site. Next. So trying to clear that up a little bit, we did another angiogram and a different, with a different obliquity. And this is an LEO obliquity. And it looks like in this view that we're a little bit above the bifurcation on the left side with our, our limb. And we see a little bit of blush of contrast into the distal sac. And I'm still not certain here, Rich, whether this is a type 2 or a, a type 1B. It gets, feels kind of late. Yeah. But it looks like the flow in the lumbars is away from the aorta rather than into the aorta. Next slide. Yeah. And now we've got a couple of retrograde injections in a different view. And in this view, it suggests that we don't really have as much room as we thought between the end of the graft and the internal iliac. This is an REO projection. Next slide. Yeah. Or next uh, image. And if we go back to the other obliquity, it's a, it looks like there's a bit of room. So I'm not entirely sure that we have all that much room if we wanted to add an extension. We could uh, go up and do a, another balloon inflation there one more time at the distal edge and just see if that takes care of things. So I'm inclined to do that first before we deploy any more graft. Does that make yeah, sense to John, you? I would do that. Yeah, I would do that first. Uh, the worst case scenario is it doesn't work. Yeah, no harm done. Yeah. John, uh, Lawrence here. Hey, Lawrence. Is, is, hey, uh, so you think this is coming in from, from below, right? I mean, it, it seems like that's the, the it's site. My, it's my best guess. But we'll, uh, yeah. the other thing we'll do is we'll just uh, dilate the junction uh, between the, the uh, main body and the left limb while we're there. So we can come out with a pigtail. We kind of cover all of our bases. It's not a big leak. It feels kind of late. Um, it may be yeah. one of those things that will go away with time. But I think uh, we'll take the Reliant balloon now. How much time do we have, guys? Do we know the Reliant balloon? We've got a good 20 minutes, right? We go to 11.30. Reliant balloon? 25 minutes. Yeah, Thank more you. than enough time. You could do another case, John. Oh, good. <laughs> we'll line up another aneurysm for you. <laughs> so this John, is the challenge of this the, uh, case. The common iliacs really are the challenge because they're, yeah. they're short and they're not, uh, they're not particularly healthy. I think we got a good seal proximally, you know, with that reverse taper that we were worried a little bit about. Okay, we're coming back up with the balloon. I'm going to take it up into the gate here, and we'll just go ahead and dilate in the gate one more time just to make sure that uh, we've got that the way we want it. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Hart. Okay, go ahead and take that up. That's the same balloon you used before? Yeah, this is the Reliant, uh, kind of the compliant balloon from Medtronic for these procedures yeah, a little bit more. That's a nice balloon. Okay. Okay. okay, let's come on down. And we'll be a little bit more aggressive here down at the distal edge with our balloon. I'm going to have it stick out yeah, just a hair. Let's go up there. Yeah, we normally don't like to stick out there, but you're, you're going to have to. Uh, yeah, I think we got to fan it out just the tiniest little yeah, bit. Yeah, you're going to have to. And he's just, Dr. Hur's going very slowly here, but we'll go yeah. up just a little bit more. A little bit more, you got it. Okay, and if there's a problem, then I can blame it on Dr. Hur. That's right. <laughs> okay, come on down. <laughs> I'm going to bring that sheath up just a little bit over this balloon so we can get a little bit closer. Okay, let's come on out with the balloon now. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll do a little retrograde sheath injection and see what it looks like. Because if there's a leak, we ought to see it uh, retrograde. Let's hook up here and do it with the uh, assist device, okay? Okay, floored. That's okay, I got it. So, yeah, good. Uh, no, hold, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, very good. So, uh, 10 for 10? 10, 10. Uh, 500? Okay. Inject? 
we had probably a little bit of sailing flush in the system. Let's do one more, 10, 10. One more time. OK, ready? It actually looks pretty good. Yeah. Inject. Oh, I can see a little leak there. See it there? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's annoying. I do think that we got a pretty good look at the origin of the internal iliac here. This may be our view to work in. And so let's take a little eight. Let's take the 18. Uh, we're going to put a little extension. We got a 16 limb. We're going to put an 18 extension in there. It's uh, 57 centimeters long. 16? OK. And uh, I think that'll take care of things. So we got about a centimeter to play with. So uh, this is pretty much what we kind of were worried about, you know, with uh, not getting an adequate seal in this relatively short landing zone and a somewhat diseased iliac artery. But uh, we'll get it. Yes. John, if you're waiting for your device, uh, and for people with more experience, what's, if you had to get close to the internal, or if you had to inadvertently cover bilateral internals, what's been your experience there? What have you had to do? Well, you know, I haven't done it, uh, quite honestly. I've really uh, been loath to do that over the years. And if you're going to do it, we'd like to do it in a staged manner. So I wouldn't like to do it in this kind of a situation where we're closing both internals and the IMA at the same time. So, uh, I mean, there are surgical bailouts. You can do a bypass from the external to the internal iliac if you really get stuck. We could try and actually do a, some a retrograde uh, recanalization of the internal around the graft if we really had to, too. That would be the other option. Yeah, it's not ideal. So we see the marks of the graft. We've got a good idea of things. I'm going to go ahead and do another injection um, just to uh, clearly outline things. I'm going to just back bleed this a little bit, make sure we're OK. OK, good. Ready? Inject. Boy, that's right on it. Yeah. Probably a little too close for comfort there, huh? <laughs> Maybe. Let's uh, roadmap that, please. And uh, I think the, you, you can see more clearly internally by the array of projections. So this is the array of projections. Yeah, normally the ARIA would be the view you would use for uh, looking at the internal iliac. But uh, here, the LEO kind of shows it to us a little bit better. It's a little less foreshortened. So I think that's OK there. We'll leave it there. We're going to go ahead and do more of a slow release here. We're going to dial it out rather than sliding it. And then after we deploy this uh, graft, we're going to take the uh, reliant balloon back and, and kind of dilate the whole graft. I think my next option after this would be to put a balloon expandable stent in yeah. side. Kind of loathe to do that unless we really have to. I think we're okay. It's, it's creeping up just a little bit. We've lost a little bit of our uh, length there, which may be okay. Mm. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, pull down the nose cone now. We can get rid of our roadmap. So we didn't get a whole lot of extra length there. We got maybe a centimeter at most, but that may be all we'll need. OK, let's come on out, and then we'll take the Reliant balloon back. Well, you predicted this would be an issue. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I think this actually will be OK, though. I suspect this leak will go away once the patient's uh, not anticoagulated anymore.
Okay, let's go ahead and just uh, do a little dilatation there. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Go. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, we'll come down here. We want to make sure this is well expanded so that there's no potential for flow between the limbs. Okay, great. Okay, one more. Okay. And then uh, I'm actually going to ask Dr. Hur to let me just take a feel here to see uh, how much force is required. So if we rupture this, I want it to be me, not Dr. Hur. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to let that sit for a little bit. Okay. And let's come out and then we'll take the pigtail back. Let's do a pigtail shot. So I kind of missed what you guys were doing in the other case, Rich. Was It was an SFA? Uh... Yeah, it was an SFA total occlusion. He crossed it very skillfully and then used the silver hawk with embolic protection and then uh, did drug eluting balloon. Very good result. Oh, nice. Sounds like a great case. Yeah. <laughs> okay, where up. So we'll go back to our AP shot here for this. I'm just trying to think if this is still a leak. Um, I think you're right. Let the heparin wear off. Yeah, couldn't you, uh, John, theoretically just do a follow-up CT and see how it looks at that point? Yeah, I think that's possible, Michael, because it's a pretty small... Uh, leak, yep. um, and it may well seal off once his uh, anticoagulation is off. Let's hold breathing. Okay, so we'll do a run here with the breath held. It looks better. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's, uh, I don't see the leak now. I agree. You can breathe. Yeah, I think it's gone. I also like the fact that I'm still seeing the internal iliac. Right. Um, so I think we're in good shape. What do you think, guys? Looks pretty good. Agreed. So uh, everybody happy? So if we have a little bit of time, then we can go ahead and do the closure. Uh, do we have a trumalware? Trumalware? I think I'd rather close uh, close over a wire, but make it a trumal wire rather than the, the Amplatz wire. So if we have time, we'll at least show you the left uh, side being uh, closed. So as mentioned uh, beforehand, we use a pre-closed technique with two proglides, usually deployed at uh, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And we'll close over the wire. Can we show the groins? Are we able to see them pretty well here? Yeah, we can see it. So here's uh, the second. Uh, this was number two in terms of the ones. The medial one was the, the second per close deployed. And then uh, the lateral one is the first. Uh, so Dr. Park is going to help out by holding groin. Uh, before we do anything, I'm just going to wet these sutures and make sure the knots slide down. 
And we'll take the knot pushers and get them ready to go. Thank you. Yeah. So we just got everything kind of in place. Um, we'll take, uh, yes, yeah, number one, yes, thanks. So we can come out with the sheath and leave the wire in place. So Dr. Hurd's going to take the sheath out. Okay, I, I slid down the first knot. He's a pretty thin patient, which is good and bad. So now we'll slide down the second knot. Okay, why don't you let up for a second? To... I don't think we've gotten down to the artery clearly. Okay. Okay, that's better. Why don't you let up, uh, Dr. Park? Let up. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll go ahead and go back down with the first knot. What uh, flush? Saline flush? Okay. Why don't you let up, uh, Dr. Park? Okay. So we're pretty good here, I think. We're really close. I'm going to go ahead and take the wire out. And then go ahead and go down with the knot pusher again on this side. Good. So um, then we'll go ahead and I think get ready to lock our knots. Let up for a sec. Okay. Yeah, it's not perfect, but I think it'll be okay with a little bit of pressure. Very close. See that? So just a tiny use. Yeah, so that'll just be a few minutes of holding. How are we doing for time, Rich? We're doing fine. We can le we can uh, wrap it up early. That's not a problem. We can go ahead and close this for you as well, if you like. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? And we can uh, ride it out of that. If we run out of time, we'll just uh, say our goodbyes when we're ready to go off. Any questions from the audience out there? Any statements from the panel here? It's like a great case. Uh, you knew there would be an issue on the left side and dealt with it accordingly. Okay. And so uh, it's always important when you're doing the pre-close to keep track of which, uh, which device you deployed first. In this case, the medial uh, device was the uh, first one deployed, and the uh, lateral one was the second one. So I'm getting ready to uh, um, deploy. So we can go ahead and uh, okay, can come out with a sheath. Can come out with a sheath now, okay. And Dr. Park is holding pressure while we try and get at least some hemostasis. So that looks pretty good actually with number one. Now we'll slide number two down. Okay, you can let up a little bit, Dr. Park. Okay, I think we're in pretty good shape actually. We've got close to hemostasis, so we're gonna gently come out with a wire. This is 
not ideal because we have a little stiffer wire in here. I generally like to use a softer wire. So I'm coming back just very slowly with this wire. And then uh, keeping pressure on the, the knot here. Now we're going to go back again with number one. Kind of the joystick technique. Go ahead and let up, uh, Dr. Park. So here we got a, look, a little bit better hemostasis, I think, actually, than with the, uh, the smaller sheath. So we're going to go ahead and lock this knot and uh, go ahead and cut that one. And then I'm going to go ahead and go down again with a knot pusher on this side, number two, and lock this knot. And so we're almost totally hemostatic there. That'll just be a few minutes of holding. So I think we'll be good here, Rich. I think a, a yeah. challenging case on a lot of fronts uh, mm -hmm. with the... Uh, kind of the reverse taper of the inferenal neck and also the short uh, ectatic right common iliac artery requiring us to cross the internal and, and embolize it ahead of time and then the short left common iliac where we ended up with a type 1B endoleak that was successfully managed with just a tiny little bit of an extension there at the end and uh, done totally percutaneous. Yeah, great job, John. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so thanks much. again to the team. They're fantastic here. Really nice job here at the Cath Lab 5. Okay, we'll go ahead and break here. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you.